Hello, here's my homily for the second ordinary Sunday of the year. That's the 16th of January. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I'm sure you probably know that whenever we Christians hear the word Zion, or the word Jerusalem, mentioned in the Old Testament, as in our first reading today from Isaiah, we need to remember that although it was originally a message about that city, as it actually was then, we now use it as a word about the church, the people of God. It's made very clear, isn't it, in that famous hymn which ends its last verse with the stirring words, Saviour, if of Zion city I through grace a member am, let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. What is also clear, however, is that although Isaiah believed in the glory of Zion city, he did not think that glory had yet been achieved. So, he writes, he will not be silent, will not grow weary until her integrity shines out like the dawn. This is surely the same for us as members of the new Zion, the Holy Church, founded by our Lord Jesus Christ. We too believe in her glory, but we too will not be silent, will not grow weary of our work of making the church more what we know it should be. And I hope that you realise this, that this does not simply mean us individually trying to be better Christians, but also means us challenging our priests to live up to what is expected of them. No, don't expect them to work too hard for their own good, for that's no way to achieve integrity. Much more expect that your priest will be a gentle pastor and a man of prayer, rather than someone who misuses in one way or another the authority given to him. How often do people tell me of some priest who by his high-handed actions has driven them or others away from the church? or of some awful incident in the confessional, where rather than showing God's love and forgiveness, the confessor has just made the person feel even more guilty. Of course, some of these stories may not be true. It may be that the person has misunderstood the priest, but not all of them are. I remember with a mixture of horror and amusement the story Father Herbert McCabe used to tell of when he made his confession incognito in Rome. The priest ranted on about what a wicked sinner Father McCabe was, so afterwards he collared the priest and told him who he was and gave him a stern lecture on what a confessor should be like. The abuse of one's priestly office, this misuse of one's authority, is what it's meant by the word clericalism. This undue dominance by us priests in the life of the church that makes us think we can never be challenged or even questioned. How often have I answered someone's good question about some aspect of the faith only to be told how grateful they are because other priests have not been prepared to give them any kind of answer? Priests seem particularly reluctant to tell people that they do not know the answer as if this would undermine their authority. What nonsense! This is what Pope Francis has been asking the whole church to examine in the present synodal process, to examine ways in which the whole people of God can be more fully involved in its life and mission, and in which clericalism can be done away with. Of course, there are many of us who try to be good and holy priests, but even so, we can slip into ways of trying to run everything, telling laity what to do or not to do, instead of allowing and encouraging them to take their own initiatives, to use their gifts. Sometimes priests can be too efficient. Our other two readings suggest some ways in which each lay person can positively make a difference to the life of the church. The second reading speaks of the gifts of the Spirit. We might look at the example of St. Therese of Lisieux here, a simple young laywoman with no pretensions to be clever or special. 
she read this passage and could not see how any of these gifts applied to her. And she then solved her problem by reading on to, into the next chapter, chapter 13, where St Paul says that without love, none of these gifts are worthwhile. And Therese describes how delighted she was to know that this was her calling, as she writes, to be love deep down in the heart of the church. However, it's worth noting that Therese was mistaken in thinking that she did not have any of the gifts. The book about her life that she was asked to write as she was dying became a bestseller in the 19th century and is still popular today, as within her story she taught so many people so much about faith and about prayer. So she certainly had the gift of preaching with wisdom and of preaching instruction. She clearly had the gift of faith and her book and her prayers for us after her death have brought healing and help to literally thousands of people. So we should not underestimate what we might be able to do. We may have gifts that we're not aware of. Now the Gospel from John chapter 2 reminds us to humbly remember that we are all, especially priests, very ordinary water, very much less than perfect human beings. We have to remember that we will never become good through our own efforts, and that being efficient or clever certainly does not make us good. No, goodness comes when we submit ourselves humbly, as St Therese did, to the will of God. The water that we are can only be transformed into good new wine through the power of God working within us. Remember that the church has always needed renewal and restoration in every generation. We imperfect humans are always dimming the glory of the church through our own failures and sometimes through our own wickedness. Some at present may feel like Isaiah felt looking at Jerusalem and think of the church in the same way as abandoned and forsaken. Yet Isaiah believes fervently that God will call Jerusalem by a new name and he tells Jerusalem that God takes delight in you. It is the same for the church. Human organisations, be they religious or political can never be perfect because they're made up of us, imperfect men and women. If one knows the history of the church, one can see this happening again and again. That's why I believe that God can and will work as he has worked before down the generations to purify and lift up the church to proclaim more faithfully the gospel message. We, the church, the people of God, are called to be a crown of splendour in the hand of the Lord. Yes, but it is a splendour that is, that is not one in the ways the world judges best, but is one by humility and faithfulness. May we play our part as best we can. So may God Almighty bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.